the cosmology of God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, and then we're going to skip a few verses, and then down from 10 to 13. 2 Peter chapter 3, my message is the cosmology of God, beginning with verse number 3. Peter says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now, beloved, I want you to drop down to verse 10. We're going to read right through to verse 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That's what happens at the second advent. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting under the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Amen. The cosmology of God. I hope you have a little better understanding of what these texts are speaking about this morning. Our Father and our God, we praise you, Lord. We exalt your name. We magnify you, O Father. And Lord, we pray that the Holy Ghost, the resident teacher, would be present here today. And Father, you'd open up the eyes of our understanding. Grant us the understanding. Let us set, set aside all prejudices and preconceived notions and hear what the Spirit hath to say unto the church this morning. We ask it in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. And you may be seated. Beloved, right from the get-go, I want you to know that I am not going to exegete and explain the theological meaning of all of these texts here today. There's too much there, and I, wanna, I have another direction I want to go in. Instead, what I'm going to do is lift out some principles that reveal the cosmology of God. The cosmology of God. Now hear me. The Bible is not a book of science per se, but rather it's a book of moral and spiritual and eternal truth and salvation about God and the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? However, the scriptures do indeed reveal many profound and proven scientific laws and truths and principles. For example, like the law of biogenesis, as we see in the book of Genesis. Everything reproduces after its own kind. That is a scientific law, amen? Like the laws of thermodynamics. There's four laws of thermodynamics. The Bible's clear on two of them. The first one is basically the law of cause and effect, and the second law is basically the law of entropy. That is, everything de-evolves and degenerates into chaos. That's exactly what science teaches, and that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Would you say amen? Science got it from the Bible. Like the laws of astronomy, like the laws of hydrology, the Bible teaches that all waters, all rivers, all streams run into the ocean. Well, the Bible knew that long before man ever discovered it. The Bible teaches that the earth is a circle. It's not flat. I am he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, the Lord said in Isaiah 40 and verse 22. And beloved, the Bible talks about the law of gravity and the law of anthropology uh, and a host of other sciences, beloved, and they all point to an intelligent, infinite being, designer and creator that is behind the universe as you and I know it. Now the question is this this morning, what do I mean when I say I want to talk to you about the uh, uh, cosmos? of God. What do I mean about cosmology? Well, I want you to look in verses 5 and 6 of 2 Peter. Why don't I get there, Joel? 2 Peter, verses 5 and 6. Notice what he says. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now watch this. 
whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Now that word world there is the Greek word cosmos. And by the way, we get our English word cosmetic from that. And that word cosmetic means to make order out of chaos. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm not jiving you, okay? That's where we get our English word cosmetic from, to make order out of chaos. You know, ladies wake up, oh, this here. And then they, don't I look beautiful? <laughs> yeah, just don't bump into anybody. So remember years ago, somebody had a T-shirt. I bumped into Tammy, uh, Tammy Faye uh, Baker, and they had all kind of paint on their <laughs> I'm out to you. Oh, never mind. Who was it? Who was it? Was Tanya? No. You troublemaker. Uh, we got a lot of troublemakers in this church, folks. If I was you, I'd turn the station. <laughs> Anyways, brother, the word cause, uh, 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 world, cosmos, means the orderly development and arrangement of everything animate and inanimate in the universe. Now, beloved, the science of cosmology is closely associated with what we know today as astrophysics, which is the study of the origin and the structure of the time and space and causality and fate of the universe from the distant past right into the distant future, beloved. In other words, it deals with where we came from to where we are going. You say amen out there. That is, beloved, from the origins of the expanse of the universe and the orbits of the planets and stars and galaxy in the universe and of all of life that's on earth, beloved. Where are we heading? That's what astrophysics wants to know. That's what cosmology wants to know. But if you know the Word of God, you will know what's going to happen in the future. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, the cosmology of God and the cosmology of man are polar opposites. Although, in many areas, they do indeed share the same proven scientific path, uh, facts. <clears throat> but in other areas, the cosmology of man radically differs with the cosmology of God. And this is why, because they depart from proven scientific fact into conjectures and speculation. So that's where that radical departure takes place. There's things that they prove that we know the scriptures say. But when they depart from science into atheistic conjecture and speculation, then the best thing you can do is stick with the cosmology of God. Would you say amen out there? For example, let me illustrate what I'm saying. The cosmology of God unapologetically and dramatically states this in Genesis 1.1, that in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. Now, the Bible doesn't apologize for that. The Bible doesn't even introduce who God is. It just says it as a fact. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? Meaning that God is the creator, that God is the originer, originator. God is the grand designer and ultimate ruler of the universe, beloved. And science, real science, proves that there must have been some type of supreme designer behind it all because everything's just too orderly and fits into its place. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, the Bible teaches in Genesis and throughout the Bible that God in his infinite and his supernatural intelligence and his supernatural power spoke everything into existence ex nihilio, that is everything out of nothing. Now the Bible reveals that there is a pre-existent being called God. And when God spoke spontaneously, supernaturally, everything from nothing came into existence. And when it did, it was an orderly arrangement of everything. Would you say amen out there? There was no time for evolution, the Bible teaches. Adam was created full grown. Every plant that you see was created full grown, beloved. And for example, you take bee. A bee needs pollen. He needs honey. If there wasn't a flower that was full grown, any process that was missing there, there'd be no flower and there'd be no bee. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, it's important that we understand where Peter's coming from here. Now, Scripture reveals that Almighty God is the mastermind. That Almighty God is the causal agent behind every created being, uh, being and thing in the universe, beloved. And this is consistent with the laws of true knowledge and reason and logic. 
didn't just say amen out there. I, I wear a watch right here, and I've used this before. I, I didn't just say, hey, a bunch of bolts, threw it into my office, and 30 years later I came in, and voila, it was a watch. You wouldn't believe that. First thing you say is, where'd you get the nuts and the bolts? You see, God knew what he was doing. It, it'll make you understand something about this omnipotent, almighty, supernatural being, the causal agent behind everything in cosmology that we call God. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, and he supernaturally sustains and maintains it. He supernaturally governs and guides it. He supernaturally oversees it and providentially leads and directs it to its divinely appointed purpose, goal, and end. There is a purpose for everything that God created. There is a goal that he's trying to achieve. There is an end that he's trying to uh, reach. It's not just unfolding and whatever happens, happens. You see, the cosmology of God teaches that he is in sovereign control of every stage and every age of the universe from the dateless, timeless, eternal past, present, and future. There never was a time when God never was. Would you say amen there? So what am I teaching you? I'm teaching you this, that the cosmology of God is clear. The cosmology of God in Scripture is direct. It is scientific. In the areas that it can be proven, it has been proven. Would you say amen out there? Conversely, beloved, the cosmology of man is rooted in and built upon the unproven atheistic theory of evolution. Consequently, that's why it's so ambiguous and so contradictory, beloved. If you get two evolutionists in a room, they can't agree on anything. Well, there was a bang theory, you know, you know, all of a sudden, spontaneous combustion. Yeah, God said, let there be bang, and there was light. <laughs> okay. God said, let there be a heaven above and the earth, be bang, and it came into existence. You see, beloved, the cosmology of man, that's why it's so vague, because of these unscientific and ridiculous atheistic privileges. Now, why, beloved, is it so ridiculous? Because the cosmology of man teaches that everything came into existence, now listen to me, by random chance, that is ex nihilo fit. That's the Latin phrase for that. We say ex nihilo, they say ex nihilo fit, meaning out of nothing comes everything. And beloved, that is an unproven and utterly impossible thing that no one yet has ever proven. Would you say amen out there? I'll tell you right now, atheistic evolution is more of a religion than you and I would ever have. You've got to believe things you can't even prove. Now hear me. The cosmology of man teaches this. Now listen. They teach no one, plus nothing, plus time, plus chance, equals everything. Virtually contradicting every scientific law and and I thought about that. I said, you know, it's like in Acts chapter 26, verse 24, when God just said to Paul, as Paul was pleading him, he says, much learning doth make thee mad. That's what it does to the evolutionist. He gets a few degrees behind his name, beloved. Much learning doth make thee mad. Amen? Why? Because all sinful, fallen, prideful man does is he refuses to accept and acknowledge the incontestable evidence of creation conscience that points to a divine being, to a grand designer of the universe, and that grand designer the scripture calls God, Elohim, or Yehovah. Truly, as Psalm 14, 1 states, the fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. That word fool, Nabal, means the stupid one, the idiot one. Contextually, it means, beloved, that only the impious and stupid and senseless person utterly refuses to admit and accept all the evidence in the universe that points to a creator God. Now, what does the word atheist mean? The word atheist is a Greek word, beloved, and it literally means negative God. An atheist believes that there is no God or a negative God. Atheism is the very height of stupidity and impiety, and listen to me now, and iniquity in God's sight. They are sinning uh, against God in an awful and a blasphemous way. They're denying everything that God has pointed out to man so man can find God. Would you say amen out there? Now, 
Why, beloved, is it such impiety and stupidity and iniquity? Because of this. Now listen to me. Follow me. The first law of lo logic states that it is utterly impossible to prove a universal negative. The first law of logic says it's utterly impossible to prove a universal negative. In other words, throughout the whole universe. In other words, beloved, what I'm saying is this here. Atheists cannot prove their claim that there is no God, for this would require them to have both infinite knowledge of the universe and to have gone everywhere throughout the universe to personally see and prove that there is no God. Yes, I was out into the Milky Way and I saw there was no God. Yes, I was out in Pluto and the planets and the sun and the moon and the stars. I looked everywhere. I looked under the rocks. I looked behind the gas. And guess what? There is no God. No atheist has ever done that. I'd rather be an agnostic. An agnostic believes, look, there could be a God. They can't. There may, may be a God, may not be a God. I just don't know. That's smarter than being an atheist. You see, beloved, atheism is both illogical and it's ridiculous. Personally, beloved, I don't have enough faith. I don't. To either be an agnostic or an atheist or evolutionist. Why? Let me tell you why. Because it requires you to have to tacitly deny overwhelming an irrefutable, proven scientific evidence and facts that factually disprove it. And to me, that is the height of self-delusion and deception and dis dishonesty. How about you? I mean, if something can be proven before me, I have to say then that is indeed true. Not lie to myself, because I don't like it. I told you a little smidgen about the cosmology of God and the cosmology of man. Well, I want you to look at verses 3 and 4. Peter says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Ha! Jesus is never coming back. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the creation of the world. Now Peter is about to give us four stages and ages of God's cosmology here. But notice these people, well, but the Bible warns that in the last days, just before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, that both the church and the world will be fraught with apostasy. In the church, there would be a great defection from the truth, a great defection from the fear of God. Likewise, in secular society, they, they would depart from the fear of God. They would push God right out of the picture. They'd say there is no God. At least before, we had a lot of deists in America. Today, we're just waning. That is, they believed in God, a God out there. But today, beloved, men have no fear of God before their eyes. And consequently, many in the church and many in society deny that there will ever be a second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to this earth in glory to judge the world. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, the first coming of Christ to earth to redeem man was the pivotal point in human history. But now scoffers who live just to satisfy and gratify, Peter says, the lust of the flesh, mock the promise of his second advent. They mock that Jesus coming back to consummate his redemptive plan for man and bring judgment on this earth. It is foolishness unto them. Why? Because Peter tells us, in their lusts, in their un and in their carnality, they fall into abysmal moral and spiritual darkness and dullness, ladies and gentlemen, and they have a false sense of security that the world will never end. The world, they're saying, won't end because Christ is coming back to consummate human history. That'll never happen, they said. All that is is a myth. Well, if they had read the Word of God, they would see that it's not because the Word of God always proves itself true. Would you say amen? Especially, beloved, those who say they're quote-unquote scientific ought to see what the Word of God has to say. So these folks argue that the world never has nor ever will change, but will continue to go on forever as usual ad infinitum. And Peter now refutes the arguments of scoffers, both then and now, by rebuking them for their willful ignorance of the Scriptures. How does Peter do it? And I love the way he does it, by using the Scriptures to historically explain to them the cosmology of God and His mastery 
over all time, over all ages of the world since it began, beloved, that have been written down within the pages of antiquity in the Word of God. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, that God will indeed bring all things to its divinely appointed end in the future for which it was created just like he promised. I can look back, listen, if the evidence is strong enough, I can look back and I can walk on that plank and it's never let me down, then I have enough confidence to say, if God said it's going to happen in the future, I'm going to walk on that plank also. Because God has brought it to pass and it's been written down and it's historical fact for us now. But a lot of people today don't even think about the Word of God uh, being the final court of appeals and all morals and, and, and uh, spirituality, beloved, and authority on what, what the, uh, science literally has to say in those areas. So, beloved, to warn all offers of the certainty of Christ's return and the end of the age in human history as we know it, Peter reveals to them and us four aspects of the cosmology of God in these texts. Now, a lot of Christians just blow right by it and they overread it uh, or read over it, and they don't see what Peter is saying. But the first thing he shows us, the first aspect of the cosmology of God is the primeval world. The first aspect of the cosmology of God is the primeval world. Look what he says in verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, but that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That ought to immediately bring your mind right back to Genesis 1. 1, 1. Amen? 1, 2, 3, actually. So Peter now rebukes them. He reminds them all these scoffers, listen, you're choosing to willfully be ignorant of the Scriptures and what it has to say about the origins of mankind, what it has to say about the origins of this whole universe. So, he says that in Genesis, it teaches that God, God himself, is the creator. He's the sustainer of the world, of the cosmos. And, beloved, that primeval world, that is the time of six days of creation, to the time of Adam and Eve's uh, fall, that the world was made in pristine perfection. And he's saying, if you'd read it and believe the scripture, then you'd have known that Genesis 1-3 says that God saw that everything that he made was very good. What would you say, amen, out there? Meaning that it was physically perfect. Meaning that it was morally and spiritually perfect, including Adam and Eve. Oh, beloved, he made Adam and Eve in his own image and his own image. Consequently, they were perfect, made right from the very hand of God, the crowning work of God's creation. Would you say, amen, out there? Then, beloved, the world then was a paradise. The Bible teaches if you read the Word of God, it was a perfect, flawless, and faultless utopia of moral and spiritual and physical excellence and peace and perfection, beloved. The world then was paradise. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God made it without sin or danger. God made it without any fear or pain or tears. God made the world without there being any suffering or sickness or disease. And God made the world without there being any death. But he warned the world, if they ate the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they would surely die. And we know that they did. Now, beloved, the primeval world then was perfect. It was filled with life. And it was filled with love and joy and peace. It was filled with abundance. The Bible tells us it was filled with God's divine blessings, benefits, and bounties. Everything lived in perfect harmony and unity and conformity to the laws of God. They lived without fear, and there was no hurt, there was no harm on the earth. All these people have to do is read the Word of God. Would you say amen out there? And see what God had to say. Indeed, man, man was made to live forever and walk and talk with his God and live in close union and communion and fellowship with him. That age, that primeval world then in accordance with the cosmology of God who created and controlled it was indeed Beulah land. The Bible calls it the Garden of Eden. Would you say amen out there? Beulah land, where everything was blessing, where everything was happy, where everything was joy, and there was communion with God. But Peter warns that all scoffers, 
all scoffers who are willfully ignorant of the scriptures and who mock the promise return to judge the word in righteousness, forget how God dealt with that perfect primeval world back then, beloved, when sin entered into the picture. And it's so easy to do because our hearts get callous, don't they? Our hearts and our conscience get callous and they get deadened because of sin. And men have a tendency to forget. They forget that God is a holy God. And they forget that God is morally and spiritually perfect. He's the moral and spiritual governor of the universe. And they forget that God utterly hates sin and God judges sin. And they forget that God entered that perfect age in judgment because of sin. When sin entered into the picture, would you say amen? You see, they forget that. They ignore how according to the cosmology of God, because of sin, He then cursed mankind. He then cursed the earth. He then cursed creation. He then cursed the world. And when He cursed it, beloved, gone was perfection. Gone was paradise. Gone was a, a perfect utopia. Gone was the God of Eden. Therefore, as God judged sin then, He'll judge it again. And that primeval world and age ended in judgment. That's the first thing I want you to see about the cosmology of God. The first aspect, the primeval world, that perfect world ended in judgment. And anyone who would read the Word of God, who would believe the Word of God, would know that that's true. Would you say amen? That would have been scoffers then. There would have been mockers then. They'd know, they'd know that that is the truth. The second aspect of the cosmology of God is the past world, the past world. And that also ended in judgment. Look in verses 5 and 6. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now here Peter reminds all scoffers how God next dealt with the antediluvian world. That is, with the sinful people from the time of the fall and Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden, Eden to the time of Noah's flood. In accordance with the cosmology of God, that age, that world, lasted approximately 1,675 years. Then God totally destroyed it because of their unbelief and because of their apostasy and because of their wickedness. Beloved, as the primeval world ended in judgment by God, likewise, the past world of Noah also ended in judgment, the judgment of a great deluge that was sent by God. I get a kick out of people say, I don't believe there was a worldwide flood. And we see on the news at night floods all over the world, all over the country, washing away cities, washing away towns, taking down houses and barns and cars and everything, and they don't believe it. And yet they find fish fossils on the top of a mountain. How'd they get there? They have climbing boots on? How did they get there? Did they fly up to the top there? The Mount Everest? Get a kick out of that, beloved. See, all you have to do is be willfully ignorant of the Word of God. Not believe what God has written. Not believe what God has said. Not believe what God has done. That's all you have to do. And then you'll be too smart for your own britches. Much learning doth make thee mad. You listen to me now. God sent floodwaters that utterly destroyed all impenitent sinners and spared only Noah. The Bible says Noah and seven other members of his family because he alone, imagine that, millions on earth, he alone, the Bible says, found grace in God's sight. So, oh, beloved, you take a stand for God. Don't you marry what people say about you. You're a Pharisee. What, are you holier than thou? No, I'm as holy as I'm trying to be and God wants me to be. I'm not going to listen to you because I see your life and I see your family and I see what's happened to you and I don't want that to happen to me and I don't want it to happen to my family. How's about you? I see the way you're heading. Beloved, listen to me. There's an old saying, you can always tell a person what kind of person he is by the friends he keeps. Amen? Those who are holy like to hang with holy people. Those who are backslidden like to hang with back. They look for people that are there in the same situation as I am. I feel comfortable around them. Yeah, you, you don't feel convicted around them because they're living as sinful as you are. 
Now you listen to me. Noah alone found grace in God's sight. Scoffers then and now, they have a short memory in regards to how God himself deals with impenitent sinners in every stage and age in accordance with the cosmology of God that he has revealed in the word of God. Amen? Scoffers forget that Noah was a preacher of righteousness during this 120-year period of time that he spent, he spent building an ark. Day after day, beloved, imagine Noah preaching the truth. There is a flood coming. You better repent of your sins. Turn from your wicked ways. And we think out of sight, out of mind. And I've taught you, because the wheels of God's justice turn ever so slowly, we think that they don't grind up ever so quickly. But God is long-suffering. It says it right here, God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Amen. God is long-suffering to us would. Not willing that any should perish, he says in verse 9. It's not that God won't do anything. God doesn't want to, but he will do it. And he has done it. And God says, I've revealed it to you in the word of God, and either you believe it or you don't believe it. Amen? So there's Noah preaching day and night. All the while, people are mocking him. And he still boldly proclaimed that a universal flood was coming to destroy all sinful men from the face of this earth, beloved, because they refused to repent. But you know what? They didn't believe Noah. What do you mean God's going to judge sin? Come on, are you crazy? I mean, that's old-fashioned judging. We're in the 21st century right now, or in Noah's day. Come on, look around, Noah. You're all by yourself. An ark? An, uh, really? An ark? Are you kidding me? What is an ark? <laughs> What is, what is that drop? What, what is that? See, they had never seen rain pour like that before either. They saw the mist and the dew coming off the earth. But what is that? Noah, Noah, we're getting wet now. Noah, no, can you see him pounding on the side of the ark? Let us in, let us in. We believe right now. Too late, too late. It's too late, beloved, and someday it'll be too late for a lot of people. And that's why I tell you to keep your account short now. You're one heartbeat, one breath before saying, too late, it's too late. Let me in, let me in, like the ten virgins said. And only five of them. Fifty percent, imagine that. If that's a, I don't know if that's a fixed number from the church. or well, I haven't even started this yet, so i got 40 minutes. No. <laughs> okay. I'll finish this quick. Beloved. But you see, beloved, it, it amazes me that people refuse to think about it. They think they can get away with anything that they're doing. And that's our fault on this, isn't it? Indeed, it says in Genesis 6, verses 5 through 13, that when God saw the wickedness of men upon the earth, beloved, that it repented him, that God regretted that he had ever made man upon the face of the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And beloved, as then, so now, sinful people in every age refuse to believe that God's judgment will come upon them because of their sin. Refuse to believe it. You see, you're comfortable at home right now. You've got three hots in a cot, money in your pocket. Oh, I've gotten away with it. No, you haven't. The goodness of God is to lead you to what? Repentance. You won't say in that day, all my life was, was miserable. And you don't understand. Remember, God's going to say, wait a minute. Did you have to go bread? Well, no. Do you have clothes on your bed? Well, well, yeah. Do you have some food in your belly? Well, 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 yeah. Could you get where you need to? Well, well, yeah. What are you complaining about? Didn't I take care of you? Wasn't my goodness towards you? Trying to show you, look at you. Look at me. I'm a good God. I'm a great God. I love you. I want to save you. I want to redeem you. But you refuse to believe what the word of the Lord has to say. So what was the earth like during Noah's day, beloved, before God destroyed it with a flood and took them all away? Well, this afternoon, just read Genesis 6 through 8. The Bible says that it was filled with violence, just like today. The Bible says it was filled with moral and spiritual corruption and wickedness, just like today. The Bible says it was filled with evil, just like today, beloved. It was filled with unbelief. It was filled with apostasy, just like today. But the Bible says, for all men had lost their way on earth, and the imagination of their heart was only evil continually from their youth, just like today. How 
can I get away with this? How can I cut the corner of that? I know God wants me to do this, but I'll walk that fine line and see if I can get away with it. The imaginations of their hearts were only evil continually from their youth, the Bible says. God said it. Consistent with the cosmology of God who frames every age. Beloved, He expects every age and the people in it to uphold His holy and righteous and godly moral and spiritual values and standards. Why? Lest they now bear His punitive judgment for defying and disobeying them, and God then terminates that age of dealing with men, and He does it with judgment. Now, the Bible says about judgment, it's a strange work for God, but it's a necessary one. God does not like to judge, but His divine attributes force, make have to. Otherwise, he can't be the holy, righteous, just God that he is if he lets people get away with all the stuff that they're getting away with. Amen? In Matthew chapter 15, beloved, verse, uh, verses 37 and 38, I'm not going to quote the whole thing to you. Just give you an example. But Jesus warned that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming days of the Son of Man. And he goes on, he says, before the flood, people were gluttonously eating, and they were drinking, and they were partying, and they were marrying, and they were giving in marriage, and they were divorcing, and they were remarrying. remarrying. In other words, what Jesus is saying is they were totally engrossed in reckless and riotous living. It was a normal way of life for them, just like it is a normal way of life for most people today in this world. Jesus said people were pleasure orientated. Is that true today? People were, listen to me, partner orientated. Given in marriage, I don't like this one, I'll go with that one, I'll shack up with this one. Oh, girls, hold on to your virginity till you get married. Men, hold on to your virginity till you get married. Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself a virgin in God's sight. And walk upright before your Lord. Jesus says people were party orientated. Now, before I, I understand that, because I love to party. Before I was saved, I could party right now, <laughs> okay? Anywhere. I was always game for it. I love to have fun. I love to cut up. I thank God he saved me. I still love to have fun. And I still love to have cut up, but it's good, clean fun. Would you say amen? You better say amen. And Jesus taught that people then were pernicious orientated. In other words, beloved, Every man, as in the days of Judges, was doing what's right in his own eyes. If they thought it seemed right to them, they did it. If they weren't convicted about it, as hot as stone, they did it. You see, they did what was right in their own eyes. They became the standard of moral and spiritual judgment in this world. And it amazes me, we have all these people from the Republicans and the Democrats saying we were going back to the original mandates of the Constitution and none of them kept it anyways. <laughs> Only when it suits their argument, you know. <laughs> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Would you say amen? Donald Trump is not my savior. The Republican Party is not my savior. Uh, the Senate is not my savior. The House of Representatives and the is not my savior. Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my savior. Come on and say amen out there. I'll tell you right now. So Jesus warns that this is precisely what will happen at his second advent. And he says, in a day and hour when the church and world will least expect it, then he will suddenly come back and judge the world. Then he will suddenly come back and rescue his saints. Then he will suddenly come back and he'll damn sinners. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying in the cosmology of God, he judged the prime evil world. And it was perfect, but it ended in judgment. That in the cosmology of God, he judged the past world in Noah's day, beloved, and it ended in judgment. And now, Peter says in the cosmology of God, Jesus will return and he will judge the world that we're living in. That brings me to point number three. The third aspect of the cosmology of God is the present world. The present world in which we now live, beloved, it too 
is headed for judgment. It's judgment bound in accordance with the cosmology of God. Look what he says in verse 7. The heavens and the earth which are now. You ought to underscore that. By the same word, notice God is speaking, are kept in store, reserved under fire, not water, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now listen to me. After 370 days on the ark, the water in Noah's day began to recede. And Noah stepped off the ark, and in the cosmology of God, he began a brand new age, or what we would say a brand new cosmos, a brand new world. And that is the one in which we now live. Now, when Noah stepped off the ark, the Bible teaches that he became the new Adam. He is the one from which we all descend. The Bible says it was through Noah and his sons that God repopulated the earth. Would you say amen out there? So this present age extends from Noah's disembarking of the earth to the end of the church age, culminating with the second advent of Christ and the day of judgment heading off into eternity. This is what Peter is speaking about here to those scoffers, to those mockers. During all the ages in the cosmology of God, what well, we need to understand is that God just say, I judge you. During all those stages and ages, ladies and gentlemen, God poured out His infinite mercy and grace to try to save as many men as He could through the coming of the Messiah. We now live in that New Testament era and age whereby the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, has already come. Would you say amen? So God's doing everything. He's done everything in His part to redeem, save mankind. That's God's heart. He wants men to be saved and come on knowledge of the truth. Would you say amen out there? And that's why God sent His Son and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? The Bible says He came to seek and save that which was lost. That's you and me. Why? So we'd believe the gospel and we'd put our faith in Him and we'd have our sins forgiven and we'd be indwelt by the Holy Ghost and we'd have our names written in the Lamb's book of life and we'd become a new creation in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. So Peter warns those who scoff at Christ's return to close out this age and consummate human history and inaugurate the day of judgment. He says that God's judgment is pending. It's pending just like it was in the primeval world that ended in judgment. He's saying, look back, look back at that. Look back at the past world of Noah. That started off well, but it ended in sin and in judgment. Amen? And so, beloved, this time, in the cosmology of God, He'll not destroy the earth with a flood, but He says He will burn up everything on this earth. It will be destroyed in a great conflagration, a great fire that will destroy the very elements of this earth. And then, beloved, there'll be no more mercy. And then there'll be no more grace or time to repent. There'll be no more salvation. There'll be no more eternal life. And then all unsaved men will be condemned to the lake of fire, beloved. And this old world as we know it right now will be burned up. And human history as we know it will finally and forever end. God will consummate His redemptive plan for man. Would you say amen? I pray that you're not willfully ignorant of the Scriptures. I pray that. When I say you, I mean all of you. Me too. (laughs) It's an editorial you. A lot of people are weary of that. They think that God is just love. He's just too good. He'll never do it. But God has done it. And He's done it again. He's done it again. He's done it again. And He will do it again. Would you say amen? Peter says you need to know about the cosmology of God as He's revealed it in the Word of God. And fourthly, and I'll close with this. The fourth aspect of the cosmology of God is the perfect world. We've seen the primeval world, the past world, beloved, the present world, and now he shows us the perfect world. Look what he says 
in verse number 13. He says, nevertheless, we, we Christians, we who are walking with God, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Beloved, we are looking forward. We who are walking with the Lord, we who know the Lord, are looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts chapter 3, verse 21, that that will be the time of the restitution of all things. Would you say amen out there? The Bible says in 21, in verse 5, that Jesus says, Behold, I will then make all things new. Amen? There'll be a new heavens. There'll be a new earth. We're in dwelleth righteousness. There'll be no more sin or suffering or sickness or death. Any of that, beloved. That's all done now. All those things were caused by sin. Now we're in a perfect environment, a perfect utopia. Paradise lost has been paradise found. And God says, nevertheless, we, according to His Word, ought to be in accordance with the cosmology of God. We're to look for a brand new heaven and a brand new earth and eternal life in the eternal incorruptible state to come in the kingdom of God, beloved. And therefore, we must do something. The Bible says we must be morally and spiritually prepared for the eternal cause must to come. In other words, if you're ever going to get your life right, now is the time to do it. This day, today. Not next week. This time. You know, God hasn't come so far. All kinds of excuses people use, amen. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, seeing then, that all these things shall be dissolved. That is, in verse 10, the elements will melt with fervent heat, the earth will pass away. He says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, conduct, and godliness? Jump down to verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And then he goes on, he says in verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. What steadfastness? Well, look at verse 16. It talks about Paul, beloved. He says, In things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. We will fall from our own steadfastness into resting the scriptures and into our own destruction, won't we? We'll do the same thing that they did if we don't start doing what God says here. We need to be holy to enter the eternal cosmos of God. We need to be pure. We need to be godly to enter the eternal cosmos of God. Then he says we're to be where, uh, uh, beloved, and blameless And be warned that things can happen on this side of the veil. That's why we need to walk close with God. We need to uh, uh, listen to what the Spirit has to say to us, beloved, because these are not the days to stop mocking God, believing the Scriptures, or thinking that Jesus isn't going to come again, because He will come again, and He will judge sin. So there you have it, the four cosmologies of God, the primeval world the past world, the present world, and praise the Lord, the perfect world to come. Amen. That paradise lost will now be paradise found. Praise the Lord. When the curse will be reversed. Beloved, hear me now, and I'll close. There are no radical molecules in the universe. Every single solitary molecule does exactly what God has commanded it to do. Because God is in sovereign control. Would you say amen? Everything is under His sovereign control, not man's. And He brings every age in the cosmology of God to its divine and perfectly appointed end. God knew from the beginning where He was going and where and how He's going to end it all. Amen? And like dominoes, we've seen those cosmologies of God, the primeval world, the past world, the present world, pop, 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 like dominoes falling. But praise the Lord, if you know the Lord Jesus, and how do I know I know Him? If you keep His commandments. How do I know you love Him? If you obey Him. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. He that saith he loveth me and keepeth not my commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth the commandments of God, in him is the love of God perfected. Amen? So, beloved, that's the cosmology of God. Next time you read this, I hope it jumps over at you. 